Um, this afternoon, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. Um, we're going to uh, visit Munster a little bit. Uh, we will touch on New Zealand, Bristol, maybe, something of the past and perhaps something of the future. Uh, we might get a bit theoretical at times, so stay with me if it gets a bit dense. Um, but we'll also hear about works from the position of a producer, a curator, and an artist. These questions about sight, place, and time matter enormously, whether or not we're producers, funders, artists, or curators, or writers. Um, they matter because of the ways in which art is increasingly being commissioned to respond to specific places, such as the town square here. So I'm going to take you through a few ideas which I hope will lead us some, some questions together and some questions for our conversation tomorrow. And I'm going to start back in 2007. Um, this was a two and a half minute trailer that went out uh, across uh, cinemas in the UK uh, and on YouTube in November 2007. And yes, that's right, that was uh, Jude Law. Sorry for the Jude Law haters amongst you. Um, yay for those uh, who love him. Um, and it was directed by uh, Jason Martin. Now, this was a trailer for a reenactment of the same sequence of events by the same actors in real time on the 30th November 2007 at Borough Market, which is a, a fashionable food market in Southwark near the town, Tate Modern. The trailer was a component of a work by Pavel Outhammer entitled Real Time Movie, and it uses the conventions of cinema to draw attention to an event that is supposedly going to happen in the future. It directs you to the experience, come see experience, to become part of the experience of the work. Now, the absence of any dramatic action in particular in the trailer suggests that the drama is about to happen. It's going to occur on the 30th of November. Now, not surprisingly, of course, the presence of Jude Law on the day uh, attracted huge crowds. This was the scene, the reenactment of those exact same set of actions, those exact same set of people in Borough Market on the 30th of November, and this is who turned up. The subtleties of Borough Market, uh, the sun coming through across the beautiful food market, were replaced, of course, by this frenzy of cameras, bodyguards, and jostling celebrity watchers. But the work sets up for me a number of questions that I'm skeptical about. Where's the situation of this work in the past or in the future? How does this work constitute a site-specific artwork? How might this work offer up a useful consideration of modern times forever, Superflex's film? There's an emphasis in this work on that word experience, but what did the experience of this time and place specific work constitute? Now, importantly, we should note that it was commissioned as part of this exhibition, The World as a Stage, which some of you may have seen at Tate Modern, an exhibition which sought to bring the realm of performance into dialogue with gallery-based work. The work forms part of an ongoing restaging of Althammer's film project. It began in 2000 as Motion Picture. Notice that subtle change in title from this in 2000, Ljubljana, uh, as Motion Picture, to uh, 2007 as Film. And this was for uh, the Euro European Biennial Manifesto III. This was organized as an event staged for a public location. And that ver version of the work deployed 11 stage and screen actors who spent 30 minutes seamlessly playing the roles of various urban dwellers, so a tourist, a pair of lovers, a skateboarder, etc. Now, because of the sort of quasi-secret nature, the actors were unannounced, and left without even acknowledging there'd been a performance. The work provoked onlookers to approach non-participants and ask if they were part of the spectacle as well. And the performance was filmed and then shown as a trailer as part of the exhibition. And outside the exhibition, the performance continued to be replayed day on day throughout the exhibition. So you walk through this performance of actors only to see a trailer for what you had just walked through. 
In 2004, Altama restaged the performance uh, and a 90-second film trailer for the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, where it was compared to a kind of video realist painting. But noticeably, unlike real-time movie, this unannounced performance blended seamlessly with the everyday. So what's changed between 2000, 2004, and 2007 in this durational uh, uh, work that has different iterations? Now, on hearing the inclusion of Jude Law, uh, my jaw dropped, and I thought, ah, has Altama sold out here? And on seeing the sleek trailer emphasizing a single event, I wonder whether the integrity, the unannounced quality of the former manifestations of motion picture had been lost. Did the fact that the Tate commissioned this work mean inevitably that the experimental, invisible qualities of the works were, were lost? Possibly. But let's look at it another way. Perhaps real-time movie is just one of a series of works for which the event of situation, rather than the fixed physical location of sight, is more resonant. Real-time movie self-consciously deploys the systems of viral distribution and promotion through which the Tate brand is sustained. So the complicity in the making of the work is shared by us all as we click on YouTube, as we follow these kinds of posters on Art in the Underground to the Tate Modern or to Borough Market. It's so that the engagement with that viral marketing becomes about expectation, about the search for where the authentic experience of the work really lies, about who is authoring the work through its multiple stagings and playings out. Such a consideration of how the work has progressed from the site and context of Manifesto 3 to the world as a stage for Tate affords us the opportunity to consider how works such as these are situation-producing as well as they are situation-specific or situation-responsive. Characterized by the viral marketing of the film and celebrity industry, such works operate through the mechanism of event culture, often utilizing the iconic filmic or epic image to aid the dispersal of the work internationally. And I'm thinking here particularly of such works as Javier Tellez' One Flew Over the Void, or Francis Elise's, which is there, or Francis Elise's Guards, or Tanya Bruguera's Tatlin's Whisper, uh, which was an unannounced performance in which mounted police herded the public around Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. These works uh, occur in public space. They're uniquely time-based, and yet they circulate in the art economy. They're performed and participatory. Yet, how do these works correspond to the quieter, sometimes unannounced works, such as, this is still from um, Ruth Ewan's Did You Kiss the Foot That Kicked You, which is an art angel commission, a performance of a strident folk song by a hundred buskers at the same time, across London. So if you're a rather bemused commuter, you'd go down one tube station hearing a busker playing one song, come up the other side and hear the same song being played. Often temporary and interventionist, invariably performed by individuals other than the artist, mobilizing and demanding different kinds of public engagement, these works are situation responsive, but as I say, situation producing and they contest the power dynamics of the context in which they operate. They refrain from indulging in a literal reading of the specifics of location. Now, what distinguishes many of these practices now um, is that they emerge as part of broader curatorial initiatives and exhibitions and festivals. Modern Times Forever, for example, is commissioned precisely within this context. They emerge from a specific response to place. But how do these works relate to place? What kinds of engagement do they engender? What do we expect from them? I want to start by thinking about the represent representations of another work that seem to indicate the moment at which the search for the experience of being present in the presence of an authentic work of art is performed for the camera. Some of you may remember this. Bruce Nauman's Square Depression 
was conceived for the 1977 edition of Sculpture Projects Munster. This 50 metre square intersection of white concrete sinks into the ground to a depth of about two and a half metres. Its edges extending downwards and crossing at the lowest point in the centre. The image presents itself as an ideal cipher for the culmination of a contemporary grand tour. This was in 2007, if you remember, when Munster, um, Venice and Art Basel all uh, occurred at the same time. Now this image and the way in which both of these art magazines have used it identically epitomizes the somewhat reactionary curatorial stance of Robert Storr who in his assertion to experience art in the present tense maintained biennials are places in which virtually anyone within reach can restore the aura that some have feared art has lost forever but which those who are alert can still summon for themselves in the presence of a unique image or form. It's interesting, isn't it, that term, unique image or form, this idea somehow that an authentic moment, an authentic form lies out there for us to search out and find and experience. Some 30 years in waiting, Nauman's work offers a space in which the performance of that authentic moment can be enacted. I'm standing in the Bruce Nauman. I've arrived, I've made it, I'm here. Not surprisingly, the magazine's editorial teams chose to crop the same press photograph in which the subjects at the axis of the work, one of whom is the curator, Caspar Koenig, not the artist, are in the process of being photographed themselves. One critic suggested that square depression is almost a template for Rosalind Krauss's diagram of sculpture in the expanded field, not landscape, sculpture, not architecture. Krauss, of course, wrote in 1979 in that definitive text of the logic of sculpture as inseparable from the logic of the monument. By virtue of this logic, she says, a sculpture is a commemorative representation. It sits in a particular place and speaks in a symbolical tongue about the meaning or use of that place. So let's just hold that thought. That it speaks of a particular place in a particular place. Square depression, according to this theorization, of a place-specific sculpture would indeed seem to operate as a monument, fixed, stable, resolutely commemorative of the genesis of Sculpture Projects Munster from 1977 to, um, to 2007. Now, the full press photograph taken by uh, uh, Thurston Arendt it's a terrible pronunciation, I forgive, for, for, please forgive me. Um, some 10 days before the opening weekend, records the final moments of preparation. You can just see the turf being laid in the top corner there. But neither this distributed shot nor the cropped magazine cover here reveal the rather nondescript architecture in which square depression is actually cited. Instead, we have a view that's never experienced, the bird's eye view from above. Square depression, um, it's, uh, sorry, being there, of course, is absolutely entirely different. Standing on, or rather in the square, you're confronted by the conditions of that place. The university precinct, the late 60s architectural facades of the Centre for Natural Sciences, your fellow art pilgrims and passers-by. The experience indeed corresponds to Nauman's stated intention to create a kind of spatial construction, he says, of a psychological state of depression by lowering the viewer to a level below vanishing point. But it's curious how the selected image, this one, misrepresents not only that kind of enveloping experience, but it also decontextualizes and displaces the work from its context so that the representation pulls the work out of place, out of Munster, and more broadly, out of time. Certainly, the crop cover image could be said to misrepresent the experience of the work in the way in which any still image reduces the multi-layered situation of an artwork to an iconic single viewpoint. But perhaps more importantly, the image has more to say about the need to locate and document the axis the authentic moment of the artwork. 
Munster that year, for, um, I'm sure for those of you who went, for me offered a few moments of such resolution. Um, and this, I think, is precisely because emergent forms of contemporary art seem more closely aligned to a kind of contemporaneity, which was described recently by Terry Smith as a number of distinct but related ways of being in or with time. He says the quality of contemporaneity is a kind of jostling together of all sorts of things in any one moment. It's confusing. It's lived experience. It's, it's not an axis moment, an authentic moment. So this, in a sense, doesn't sound like the t kind of timelessness evoked by Nauman's square depression. More often than not, the experience of Munster that year was of delightful, frustrated intrigue. For example, the inability to pinpoint a work, such as Dora Garcia's The Beggar's Opera, which involved uh, an actor being paid to be uh, a beggar, a homeless person, and walking around with the number seven in the city. Dislocation and interruption. This is Pavel Althammer's path, which led nowhere. And displacement, Annette Veyman's arse bar, which was uh, a site in the process of being made into a potential utopian beauty spa that, of course, never became. And Gustav Metzger's uh, equivalent shattered stones, which were these stones moved around in various locations, and Martha Rosler's unsettling the fragments. All of those works have this quality of moving from one place to another, of existing in different time frames. Althammer's path, for example, I think offered a riposte to the 1960s conceptualism of Richard Long's A Line Made by Walking, 1967, with the artist astutely recognising the conditions under which the viewer would encounter this work, namely on the exhibition itinerary. Althammer seemed to understand precisely that, that we would follow his line because the map said we were supposed to. And, of course, there was no authentic experience at the end. He led the visitor off the prescribed route of a pointless, on a pointless pilgrimage. Now, the newness of such works is predicated on the ability of the artist to bring to bear their practice, time and imagination on the same way in which Superflex have done here, on a specified and often unfamiliar context. In this sense, these artists and those commissioned in Munster can be seen to be complicit in placemaking. You only have to look at the coverage that this remarkable film has got around the world to know that this film has been important for Helsinki. And in that sense, our Superflex complicit in placemaking. But it seems to me that both this film and these works are, in their responses to place, profoundly place-contesting. The curators of Sculpture Projects Munster identified this tension in commissioning between the artist's complicity and resistance to the city's image in their catalogue introduction. They said, even if due to its success, the exhibition has long become a key element in the city's marketing image, it should be able to assert itself in difference to this official identity and the staging strategies employed to promote it. So we could say that truly space-specific works in Munster were those which seemed to offer some resistance to a kind of nostalgic or literal representation of the city and in turn reflected a more complicit relationship between the curator and the artist, affecting a kind of sense of being in the wrong place, a sense of dislocation or displacement. These works signal the shift in our understanding of place and site to situation, or as art historian Miwon Kwan has suggested, from a fixed physical location to somewhere or something constituted through social, economic, cultural and political processes. So as an example, we might look at the four manifestations of Sculpture Projects Munster, for example, from the Platzsucher of 1977, epitomized by the work of Donald Jard and Klaus Oldenburg, to the location narratives of 1987 with Buren, and the conviviality of 1997 to Tobias Rehberger. Quan discusses the shift in specificity 
from a, a, a kind of bodily experience of sight through the cultural interrogation of sight to the discursive undersight understanding of site specificity today, or as I like to call it, situation specificity. So the first might be best represented by Richard Serra's understanding of specificity as an inextricable, indivis indivisible relationship between the work and its site, demanding the physical presence of the viewer for the work's completion. Best exemplified, of course, by Tilted Ark, uh, of which he infamously wrote, it is a site-specific work, and as such, not to be relocated. To remove the work is to destroy the work. 